the this film felt different to me than the other two Iron Mans. Although tonally Iron Man 1 and 2 are very different anyway. But it uh it had a heck of a lot of just Tony Stark. Goat. All right, what are we doing? That gets my goat. I thought we had retired that. Okay, I guess this is the uh, point in the show where we explain how we ran out of space on the card that we were recording onto. And we talked on for what? Probably a half hour longer? Yeah. And we realized when we were done, we signed off. We looked at the thing and it said card full. And so we lost a bunch of what we'd said. And uh, we're hoping to replicate that. But it is now two days later. And uh, we are recording in a different environment. I don't know if you can tell, but uh, it's fairly similar. We're using the same kind of device, but one with a larger card on it. And <laughs> I've got my son on my lap right now because he doesn't want to go to. He doesn't want to stay in bed, so he's going to sit here, suck on his binky, and hopefully be good. We'll have to see. Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed. I, I had just gotten that microphone the day before, and I wouldn't have guessed that it would have so little recording space on it but it records in stereo in a wave format and apparently that's just massive yes it is quite massive wave formats the uncompressed thing but yeah yeah you definitely got to get a much larger one i i got a, a 32 gigabyte card for mine and i believe yours was a two gigabyte card so <laughs> a little bit of a difference but anyways back to our conversation i think we were talking about the villains and that Mandarin was not Mandarin, but he was actually the other Mandarin, now, something like that. If we didn't say so before, what did you think of the the reveal of Ben Kingsley, the the faux Mandarin? It was well done. It was surprising. It wasn't what you expected. And the part where he's in there and he's like hiding behind that little thing and he's coming out of the bathroom. It's a really tense part where you're just like, oh, my gosh. You figure something weird is going on already because, you know, the place isn't what you would expect. Like the way they built the Mandarin up to be, he seemed like somebody who was really intense. And then, you know, there's a bunch of chicks sitting around in bikinis in this bed and it's all grungy and dirty. And so, yeah, you think something is up. So you're guessing that maybe it's not really the Mandarin. But then when it comes out, it is and it's not. (laughs) So I don't know. I mean, it's really surprising. It was a good twist. Not what you expected, but it was kind of disappointing in a way, too, because then the Mandarin isn't the Mandarin. I mean, he doesn't look like the Mandarin in the end. The guy who's, you know, Killian, who says he's the Mandarin, therefore, you know, he's the real guy behind there pulling the strings. I am the Mandarin. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of Iron Man to begin with. I don't know his comics, but still, I like, I always like it better when they try and stick more to the real comics than, uh, you know, when they change things up too much was kind of upsetting. What did you think of it? Well, I, I don't like it at all. And see, I'm not a huge Iron Man fan, and I haven't followed Iron Man my whole life. But I think if I had, I would have been furious, you know, to discover that Aunt May is actually the Green Goblin in a movie would just, you know, Aunt May killed Uncle Ben, you know, that kind of thing. I, and maybe it's not that drastic of a change, but then again, you know, Iron Man's not my hero, so I don't I don't have the emotional investment or of years and years and years of investment in this character, the Mandarin. But that's something that we've talked about before is I love that Iron Man's arch enemy is a practitioner of magic and that each of these rings that he has is a different magical ability since Tony Stark is super into technology and everything that he does is based on his ability to build things and design things and, you know, a bigger armor and an armor that does this because the opposite of, of, of technology in a way, well, maybe the opposite of technology is, is nature, but another opposite would be magic. You know, some, the the opposite of science is magic. Right. Yeah. The opposite of science could maybe be superstition or something like that. Yeah. So I always thought it would be really fun to see, you know, Tony uh, thinks that he has a grasp because he understands the mechanics of the universe and all that. He thinks he understands the way things work. And then suddenly there are things that you can't explain that no scientist can explain because it 
doesn't follow the same scientific laws that govern the universe, which I, uh, you know, they talk in Thor about, I guess that stuff that, that the Asgardians practice isn't magic. It's a different form of technology, but potato, potato, it is magic to us, to a human being that is magic. And to somebody like Tony Stark, Loki can make copies of himself or appear to look like someone else. But that's not through technology, right? He doesn't build a device that does that. He mentally is able to do that. That's my interpretation of when he makes a double and trick store. Yeah, I think so. And it should have been fine to just use magic too because it was already introduced in the Avengers and people accepted it just fine. They didn't get upset that Loki did that and now we've got that in Iron Man's world. They, you know, were okay to go together. So you think that that should be fine. They should be able to do that. But the Iron Man franchise seems kind of rooted in that same ideas as uh, the Batman Begins franchise where it's all got to be ultra realistic and you can't have a lot of the things that happen in comics because of that. But it seems like that's something they were trying to touch upon in Iron Man 3. Uh, I mean, we don't know. We never. He never actually explains what has got him all befuddled. They just refer to what happened in New York, or since New York, nothing has been the same. But what exactly is it? Because if it were Tony having to admit that there are questions that I don't have the answer to because of magic, because of other worlds, because of these kind of things, that would be an interesting growth in the character, an interesting inner turmoil with, with Tony. And to say, how do I defeat someone who has at his beck and call extra science, you know, things that, that can't be measured, things that can't be controlled. And he has to come up with what, you know, how does one defend himself against stuff that doesn't follow the natural law, the natural order of things to me, that's really interesting. That's the the core of a technological master versus a mystical master, which is the the one thing that I find interesting about the Mandarin. Um, and for years, we talked about, well, they can never do the Mandarin because his name is racist. Oh, thanks, Homer. And we don't want to offend the Chinese and all that. And so they found a middle ground where the only people that it offends are people that love the Mandarin that Stan Lee created. <laughs> yeah, and it did seem like they were at the start kind of pushing for that where, you know, Tony was having his anxiety attacks and freaking out when he would think about the craziness that went on in New York and they never resolved that. It was just left. Maybe that was something that they were leaving that they were bringing up and it was going to be resolved in Avengers 2 or something. I don't know. Um, maybe that's what the deal was behind that. And it wasn't supposed to, you know, it was a pay off to be paid off down the line, but yeah, it would have been cool. I mean, it would have made sense if they'd gone there, but they didn't, they went totally different direction. Well, see, I feel like the ending of the movie, the last, the resolution was the weakest aspect because suddenly everything is resolved, but like, Ooh, I almost said like magic, but I mean, suddenly Pepper's, her change, her fundamental change. I mean, basically, she's been transformed into a new a new species, like, like Jean Grey is the phoenix or whatever. You are no longer Pepper Potts. You're now something else. And they just snap their fingers and that's fixed. And suddenly, Tony's able to remove the, uh, the metal shards and no longer have to depend on that arc reactor in his chest. And we're like, well, if it was that simple that surgery would remove it, why didn't you do that when you came back from Afghanistan? Are we just to say that you never had the drive to remove it until now because it made you special? I mean, it was so weird that it's like, okay, Happy Hogan comes out of his coma. He's going to be all right. And you know what? I liked all the Happy Hogan stuff, every single scene he was in. But the resolution of all the other stuff, it was too resolved. It was like, hey, folks, I'm sorry, we're not going to have any more Iron Man movies. This is it. So we're going to do the Return of the King thing here, and we're going to show everybody getting home. We're going to have the good guy and the bad guy, I'm sorry, good guy and his love interest get married. We're going to show Sam get married. We're going to show Frodo and Gandalf and Galadriel all die so that there's no possibility for a sequel to Return of the King. 
just just so everything is tied up. That's what it felt like to me. It's just like this is the last Iron Man movie. Just so you guys know, we're not opening it up to a sequel. This is it. Thank you. Yeah, it was kind of weird. I'm trying to think of what it rem- it kind of reminded me of the last episode of Community that they had last season where, you know, they it was the end of the show and so they wrapped it all up. You know, they gave Jeff his, his big resolution of, you know, oh, now I've, I'm going to be all good and I graduated and all this stuff. And then I guess they got renewed and they're like, oh, crap, uh, what do we do now? We ended the show. But it also kind of reminded me too, I don't know if you ever saw the final episode that they did of Pushing Daisies, that show that we... Uh, Used to watch back in the day, but got uh, unceremoniously canceled. And they had, I guess, an episode. I think pretty much what you could tell happened was they had an episode that was the last episode, but it wasn't supposed to be the last episode. And then they just kind of added in a bunch of things, kind of like a quick epilogue. Oh, yes, and this happened, and they lived happily ever after, and here's how it happened, and it all happened off screen because we didn't shoot it. But now they're all happy. The end. And yeah, it was kind of like that, you know, where he's just like, oh, yeah, and I did fix Pepper and I also fixed this. And it just wasn't satisfying. That's for sure. He shows up at his house or I'm sorry, the ruins of his house in Malibu. And I got the impression and tell me if you got it, too, that he's not going to rebuild this house. He's like, I'm going to leave it in the sea and I'm not Iron Man anymore. Although he says, I am Iron Man is the final line of the movie, but just as a bookend, because that's how he ended the first movie, just to say, hey, we've come full circle. Goodbye. And, you know, I mean, we talked about it and I don't know if we talked about it in the pre loss part of this conversation (laughs) or if we didn't talk about it. But Robert Downey Jr. got hurt at some point in the making of this movie. And I read an interview with him in GQ where he was talking about being nearly 50 years old and that he's not a young guy anymore and and he could have been really badly hurt. And luckily, you know, he was only out of commission for a couple of days. But I told him that uh, it's time to put some of this stuff behind him and move on to the next phase of his life. And I mean, what it sounded like was, you know, I'm done being the action star, but he was never an action star until this movie. Well, well, maybe he takes off his shirt and beats the crap out of Russians in the Sherlock Holmes flicks, but you know what I mean? They never asked him to run around and dive and fight and kickbox and throw yourself off buildings until this movie. And, And to me, it felt really strange that he was doing all this fighting, actual hand to hand fighting. Cause that's not who Tony is. I mean, we saw him in the in the cave and all that where he really need, would have needed these abilities and he didn't have any of that stuff. You know, his weapon is his mind and his ability to build things. And so when it became like Miami Vice and stuff with him and, and Rhodey sneaking around with pistols, it felt like a totally different thing to me. Yeah, it did feel pretty wrong. I mean, I'm willing to bet that the part where he got hurt is the part where he only has like the one glove and the one boot and he's like flying around the room with just this stuff on because he had to have been like up on wires and stuff like that and being yanked around and etc. And I wouldn't be surprised if that where he managed to fall on his head or something. I don't know what, but... Uh, when, when his house was coming down and, you know, he's diving and trying to save Pepper and stuff like that, that looks like a place where you could actually get hurt. And, and, you know, I did really like that moment when he had the armor go on Pepper to protect her, despite the fact that there's some other woman there in the house. But it's kind of like, yeah, but I don't really care if she gets hurt. That was kind of neat that he thought of her first. Yeah, above and beyond himself and, and anybody else. And that, that was an interesting part. It, it is interesting. And you can tell that it's a different director with a different idea and behind the script, you could got that different sensibility. You were saying this guy was the director of what? The Lethal Weapon? He wrote Lethal Weapon and wrote the first draft of Lethal Weapon 2, wrote The Last Boy Scout. He did a, a, a movie that I thought we watched together called Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which was the first movie Robert Downey Jr. did when he got out of jail. You know, nobody would hire him, but Shane Black said, I'm about to make a movie and, and I'll hire you. And it was you know, the first and that maybe based on 
that he got Tony Stark for uh, the first Iron Man. But yeah, Shane Black's only ever directed that one movie and this. He's always been a screenwriter before that. Did he write uh, Iron Man 3 as well? He got a co-writing credit, and I don't know what the other guy wrote. Maybe the other guy was writing Iron Man 3 for John Favreau or something like that. And when Shane Black came on board, he says, I've got my own ideas. And they have, I mean, you never know how much work somebody actually did for the credit that they did, but it's got the two writers there. So maybe Shane Black wrote the story for Iron Man three and and part of the screenplay. But once he made the shift to direction, he focused on directing and this other guy focused on rewrites and, and okay, we got to fix this and we got to write a scene for this so that Shane Black could focus on directing. But you could definitely tell, you know, you you got a lot of those scenes where he was running around, like you said, Rhodey, like Miami Vice, where they're running around with pistols, sneaking onto a ship out on off the harbor, or uh, some other stuff. There were some other interesting things. I can't. I wish I knew where we had yeah. spoken. I, this may be something you just cut out completely, or maybe not. But uh, another totally inter, or a totally new element, I guess with this bit was the whole thing where the suits were doing stuff without anyone inside of them, which was a new thing. Like, I don't know how that becomes possible. And it also really kind of sucks because now, you know, there's several times where there's times like the time when he's saving everybody who fell out of the plane and he's going down and he's catching them. And then he gets hit by a truck and his suit just blasts to pieces, and you're thinking, oh, he must have got really hurt from that. Uh, but then he's not inside there, and you just realize, oh, he was never in danger. He was just wearing a little helmet and sitting down in the boat. So anytime he could be doing that. So I don't need to be worried at all about any of these Iron Man guys because there's not somebody inside of them necessarily. Yeah, they did. I, I mean, I understand from a story standpoint that it becomes fun to trick us and to do that with him and – and again, that he just has mental command over, and I know it's not mental, it's some nanite kind of thing in his arms and stuff, but it might as well be mental command over these robot suits. But like the one that was going to attack Pepper while he was asleep, did he just mentally bring that thing and say, you know, Pepper is bringing me down man and it uh and so the one says well i will take care of that tony see see some of the time tony was controlling them and some of the time jarvis was controlling them yeah at the end jarvis was controlling like all 40 of the ones that showed up it made me wonder yeah it was like yeah jarvis was now the superhero tony was just completely unnecessary he didn't need to be iron man i guess at the end that maybe that's why he took the shrapnel out because he was unnecessary now. The thing is, I mean, and I love Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. I think it's the best casting. Well, I was going to say ever at comic book casting, but best casting ever was Christopher Reeve as Superman. And the only other one that comes close I can think of is Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. Do you agree? Hugh Jackman? Yeah, it's just a testament to how great he is that with such a ridiculous name, we still love the guy. I, I think Robert Downey Jr. is wonderful as Tony Stark, but the character is bigger than that. The character is some essentially immortal. You know what? We're going to have Iron Man movies 30 years from now, I would hope, the same way as we always say we're going to have James Bond movies forever and, and all that. And to just say, well, Tony, that Robert Downey Jr. doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to do these movies anymore, so we're just ending the movies seems incredibly short-sighted it just doesn't this studio marvel studios was created to make these movies the right way and with a long haul in mind where you don't burn your bridges you don't kill the green goblin the first time you see him or the joker in the very first batman movie um and spoilers and so you should have in mind that hey someday we're going to have an Iron Man movie where he's somebody else. And we've gotten used to it with a number of heroes. And, you know, Iron Man is just the latest in that line. You know, I mean, it's just we had a four year gap between Spider-Man's and uh, 
by next year when Amazing Spider-Man 2 comes out, half of the people aren't even going to remember that there was a Tobey Maguire. It's just like, oh, this is Spider-Man now. Because we saw him a couple years ago, and and he's always going to be Spider-Man. And so, yeah, Tony Stark will return, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Robert Downey Jr. will return. I, I I love the guy, but if he costs that much, if he you know he made fifty million dollars on Avengers, and if he wants that again, you got to weigh it and say, okay, you know, we will alienate some people by having a new actor, but you know, this new actor is willing to do four of them. Yeah, I guess uh, it's one of those things that's going to come. It does seem weird that the, they ended it the way that they did. And yeah, I mean, like you were saying, you, you, you quoted the, the bit. You get the little bit at the very end of the credits where it just says, Tony Stark will return. It's, it's really strange that they ended it off that way. I suppose that means that we're going to get some kind of a reboot of Iron Man when the next guy comes on, which I'm tired of quick reboots after you know trilogies because it's i don't know it's funny because you know that these this movie was not or these movies were not meant to be a trilogy it's not like we've finally told the whole story you know it's like the freaking hangover part three (laughs) coming out this summer oh it's the final story of the hangover trilogy dude there was no hangover trilogy it was one movie they remade a couple of times now and they're calling it a trilogy and why is it that three seems to be where everybody thinks they have to quit? Is it just because Star Wars did three and it was such a big deal that now everybody always does three? Well, they need to go the way of like fantasy novels and do like 10 or 12 or whatever it is that the 14 novels that they usually do. Well, shouldn't Harry Potter be the new benchmark by which everything is measured? And that had eight movies. And I'm sure Warner Brothers is like, shoot, you know, we ended that sucker too soon. Those kids are only 20. You know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe Joss has in mind a very clever way of bringing Tony back in, in Avengers 2. But I hope it's not just, you know, I'll, con- I'll remote control this suit. <laughs> I, I, there were so many other stories still to be told with Iron Man. And, 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 and yeah, there are so many characters that you and I don't know, but the fans of Iron Man know. And they're like, dang it, I, want, I never got to see Crimson Dynamo, or I never got to see Titanium Man, or I never got to see whoever your, their particular favorite bad guy is. And uh, however old Robert Downey Jr. is, 48 or whatever, that is not old. Not when you basically can put on the suit, and the second the mask is on, it can be another actor. Yeah, that's the thing that, uh, you know, we we're, were saying this one's weird because he's doing all this stuff without the suit on. You don't need to do that. I mean, you can go on. He could be making these movies for 10 years at least without ever being put in the slightest amount of danger of getting another injury if they just write the script the right way. I mean, Iron Man is not supposed to be Nick Fury. He's not supposed to be James Bond. He's just supposed. He's not supposed to be freaking indiana jones who you know barrels into the trouble uh, even though he's a 70 year old dude he's supposed to be the guy that gets into the suit and then fights and so they could easily do that if they you know i mean that's the way the character is supposed to be anyways so they just continue on with it and i mean who knows what what'll happen down the line but uh you said that uh, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, was signed on to do two more Avengers movies, right? I thought so. But now people are saying that his contract is up with Iron Man 3. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I know that, uh, well, I, I, if I hadn't said so already, when I saw Robert Downey Jr. in July at Comic-Con, he seemed gung-ho about this series, doing them forever. You know, and, I mean, just like, wow, that's great. And then something happened between then and now where he doesn't want to do them anymore. And it could be that he got hurt. It could be that he got bored. It could be that it was a troubled production that we don't know about and that he and the director or he and the suits or whatever couldn't agree or got angry at each other or, you know, that it wasn't as pleasant a working environment as the John Favreau movies or the Joss Whedon movie. Yeah, the suits did start doing things on their own, so it would have been trouble. That's right. I, <laughs> but I, I think when it's a franchise kind of movie, you want to end each one 
leaving the audience wanting more. You know, the Star Trek reboot is, you know, I, I don't love the Star Trek reboot, but certainly at the very end, when Kirk gets in that seat and they, you know, he says, let's go, you want to see what the next adventure is. And, you know, same stuff with like the very first Iron Man, when he, he, he ends it with, I am Iron Man and everybody goes, Ooh, and then it just ends. You're just like, wait, wait, what did, what, what was the reaction? What happened after that kind of thing? You know, I, that the, the, probably the absolute best ending of, of any of those was the end of Batman Begins, where you show the Joker card and people, you know, go, Ooh, and then the credits roll because you want these things to go for a long, long time. I, I mean, maybe Marvel isn't a, a money grubbing capitalist company, but Disney certainly is. And for Disney to just say, yeah, okay, you can end it is so strange. Well, the Dark Knight Rises, they so clearly set that up as this is the final installment in the Dark Knight trilogy. And, you know, this is the end. This is the end. But they didn't have to end that. I think it was just Nolan wanted to end that. And uh, Christian Bale is younger than us. He could have gone on and, and been Batman another 15 years. But maybe they were thinking that the quality could only be maintained for so long. And if you do it as a third movie, I don't know. At one point, George Lucas, uh, you know, was going to do nine, 10, 15 Star Wars movies and just hand it off. And we'd still be making Star Wars movies today. And, and then he changed his mind and said, we're just going to end it out after three. But I don't know who made this decision, but it feels like it was Robert Downey Jr. and everybody was was okay with it. Um, although, I mean, how much control does he have over the finished product? Somebody had to write it. Somebody had to decide this is how we're going to end it because they could have just ended it with we killed the bad guy. Pepper, you're going to be all right. You know, I'm going to fix this and then end the movie. And we're like, boy, I hope they do. I, I, well, let's find out in the next movie yeah it seems like avi arad should have been in there to step in and say something about that whole ending i don't know if they snuck that past him somehow or what but i thought that was supposed to be his deal i don't think arad has anything to do with those anymore he he was the action figure guy (laughs) and uh, he was the only suit that knew all the characters and loved all the characters and i think kevin feige is the avi arad of the 21st century so He's the guy that should have stood up and said, yeah, let's end it three minutes earlier than you've ended it now. Maybe we got uh, the special extended cut in our showing and everybody else didn't even see this. And they're like, what the hell are you talking about? They ended it three minutes earlier than that. <laughs> the weird thing is, if they when they make an Avengers 2 and Iron Man is in Avengers 2, if they have a different actor as Iron Man, People will be kind of weirded out by that, I would think. It seems like if they were going to have a different actor that was going to be Iron Man in the Avengers, they needed to switch it already. You know what I mean? It should have been somebody else in this movie. Or there needs to be an Iron Man 4 that comes out between now and then, which isn't going to happen, but that gives us this new actor, introduces him or something like that. I don't know. It just seems weird. How, how are they going to handle Avengers 2? Well, maybe they're going to have to come up with some excuse to get Tony back into the suit. But that takes time to set that up, and it burns running time that could be focused on introducing Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch or introducing Thanos or whatever else things you've got going on. If he was just Iron Man at the end of Iron Man 3 then he could just be Iron Man at the beginning of Avengers 2. I don't doubt that Joss will pull it off and we'll all be like, wow, okay, that was cool. And and basically Robert Downey Jr. only had a cameo in Avengers 2, but it was the best cameo ever, yeah, you know, whatever. But when Iron Man 4 comes out six years from now or whenever it is, but nobody waits six years, do they? Um, <laughs> how is that going to fit into this? continuity that marvel studios has created where all of the films are in the same universe i mean so far we don't have i mean maybe there's contradictions in that this is edward norton and now that he's mark ruffalo and stuff but i think they all sort of fit right unless uh, there's something i'm forgetting they all have a timeline and this references this and this leads into this and this foreshadows this 
seagull. So it just would be a shame if suddenly there was something that, that departed from it. You know, if it became the DC universe, it has to restart itself every six years or whatever. And, and that's not fair. Marvel does it too. It's just way more annoying when DC does it. I don't know. Maybe there's some awesome plan and they're tricking us and I will eat all these words. That would be nice. Oh, I'm sure you will. Or it's something. All right. Well, I guess we've probably gone on plenty. We've recorded an extra 35 minutes to go on to whatever we already recorded. So this is going to be the giant size episode part two of uh, That Gets My Goat. And yeah, that's fine. I mean, we had the extra couple days. And in those extra couple days, Iron Man 3 is now the sick, second biggest opening of all time. Uh, I think it did a hundred and seventy seven million dollar opening, and the the reigning champ is is still Avengers. So again, there's no question that the movie was successful, and usually you'd want to make a whole bunch of those when they're, they're that successful. I don't know. I think most people that saw it liked it way better than I did, and and that's fine. You know, I just. I was so thrilled at the Avengers. I mean, there was just moment after moment after moment where it's like, wow. And, and, and I was taken away. And it's one of those things where people talk about you're having a bad day or people go to the movies to forget about their troubles, to be transported to another place. That's what the Avengers did. You know, as, as there were a couple of great moments in Iron Man three, but I, I wasn't transported away and, and, you know, I wasn't thrilled like I was. In Avengers, and maybe that means that Avengers spoke to me, and and I and it, I didn't get spoken to in this movie, and other people feel differently. But it probably just goes to show how amazing an achievement Avengers was. That I'm still talking about it a year later. I would rather talk about it than the movie you saw two days ago. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll just talk about that then instead. <laughs> No, we're going to we're going to end this episode and uh call it a night. That was our impressions of Iron Man 3. There will be many more film impressions to come, I'm sure, as the summer wears on. And uh we'll see you again for those. We'll talk to you later, folks. Thanks for listening. I'm Big Anklevich and I'm Rich Outfield. We are Iron Man. Yes, we are. That Gets My Goat is produced under Creative Commons Attribution, Non-Commercial, No Derivatives License, which between you and me means nothing. I am going to say I am Iron Man to end the movie because that's how we ended the first one. Shush. And now, Your Highness, we'll discuss the hidden location of your rebel base.